the blessing of God is going to rest on your home visibly from this day forward and there's nothing the devil can do about it if you believe that can you say amen you can be seated I want you if you have your Bible open it with me to the book of first Samuel First Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. The Bible says, After the Philistines captured the ark of God, they took it from the battleground at Ebenezer to the town of Ashdod. They carried the ark of God into the temple of Dagon and placed it beside the idol of Dagon. But when the citizens of Ashdod went to see it the next morning, Dagon had fallen with his face to the ground in front of the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him in his place again. But the next morning, the same thing happened. Dagon had fallen down before the ark of the Lord. This time, his head and hands had broken off and were lying in the doorway. Take your Bible and just flip it over a little to the right. 2 Samuel chapter 6. This is when they're moving the ark of the covenant. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Verse 9, David was now afraid of the Lord, and he asked, How can I ever bring the ark of the Lord back into my care? So David decided not to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it into the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. Then King David was told, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with great celebration. After the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf, and David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing the priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy, blowing ram's horns. One more scripture. Flip over to 2 Chronicles. Sorry, 1 Chronicles chapter 26. First Chronicles 26. Verse 4. So you check back up on Obed-Edom after they had dropped that off at his house. Obed-Edom lived in Gath, which is where Goliath was from, and the enemies of God. He agreed to keep that in his home. He was not a Levite. He lived in Gath. And look at this down the line after that happened. David took the ark back out of his house. But when you find Obed-Edom again, the sons of Obed-Edom were gatekeepers in the temple. Shemia, Jehazobad, Joash, Sekar, Nathaniel. Amiel, Issachar, and I'm not trying that one. God had rich, listen to this, God had richly blessed Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom's son Shemiah had sons with great ability who earned positions of great authority in the clan. Their names were Othni, Raphael, Obed, Elzabad. Their relatives, Elihu and Semachiah, were also very capable men. All of these descendants of Obed-Edom, including their sons and grandsons, 62 of them in all, were very capable men, well qualified for their work. The Bible says, there's this story, the Ark of the Covenant, which you probably know something about because Indiana Jones, even if you're not a Christian, most Americans just from movies know about that, that they carried a box around that housed the presence of God. And the Bible says... When, they, when the enemies of God captured that box and laid it next to their head idol, it's just a box. It was a wooden box. Nobody prayed. Nobody fasted. Nobody did anything. The presence of God laying next to that head demon God, when they came in the next day, the presence of God had leveled that idol. They were too stupid to realize what happened, so they set it back up and said, well, it never happened before. Then came back the next morning, and the thing had fallen so violently that its head of the idol had broken off and the hands of the idol had broken off. 
In fact, if you go on to read, the Bible says the men in that area that were enemies of God began to develop tumors until finally they brought the presence of the Lord back and said, we don't want this anymore. So there's an element to the presence of God. When we saw what happened with Obed-Edom, that God blessed his family. The presence of God, when it enters into your home, has two functions. Number one, it goes to war with anything that the devil set up in your home and in your family. Just the presence of God being there. Nobody praying. You know, no one was saying, look, we, we need help. There's an idol there. It was a box. Just the presence of God. Now, notice the correlation. You don't have the Ark of the Covenant in your house. I actually hope they never find the Ark of the Covenant because they'll be chipping pieces off of it and selling it on Christian TV for your greatest gift, and they'll have every host there saying, if you could just be here with us in Israel right now and feel the presence. But the Bible says it was never the will of God to dwell in vessels made with human hands. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. If you allow God to fulfill his plan for your life, the same exact power that was in the Ark of the Covenant dwells in the New Covenant Christian. If you believe that and you're thankful for that, can you say a loud Texas amen, amen. this morning? I checked it'll still be this morning for 25 more seconds. Say God's presence dwells in me. And so the first thing the presence of God does is it goes to war with everything that's of the devil. Where do you see that drawn out? 1 Kings chapter 17. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. Obviously, we don't have a demonic temple to set, to set that up in. I'm getting you to see that what that ark did to that idol, he does to everything. The presence of God does to everything that accompanies the devil. For instance, 1 Kings 17. Elijah comes to that woman's house. Elijah carried the presence of God strongly. And what shape is that woman in? My son and I are getting ready to eat our last meal and then we'll die. I, the widow of Zarephath. Number one, she's totally broke. A level of poverty that you can't even have in Texas because there's food banks. The churches have food banks. Everywhere. We have to, <laughs> if you don't have any food, people start actually picking their favorite food bank, yelling at the one church for not carrying the type of food that they want. And so we don't even have here what they had there where there's a famine and they've made a decision, we're going to eat our last meal and then die. Not poverty, abject poverty. And what did Elijah do with the presence of God? Gave her an instruction. She followed the instruction. And the cruise of oil and the jar of meal never failed until the end of the famine. The Bible says in 1 Kings 17, 16, no matter how much she used. Everybody say no matter how much she used. There was always plenty left over. She didn't have to dish it out and be judicious no matter how much she used. She went from not having enough, which to put it lightly, to having an overflow where no matter how much she used, there was always plenty left over. Number one, poverty. Number two, the boy died. First, this is still 1 Kings 17. Her son got sick and then he died. Death ran in that family. Sickness and disease was a part of that home because before Elijah came on the scene, the husband's already dead and he had a son, so he's not old. My, son, my husband's dead, now my son's dead. Elijah goes up into the room, prays, lays on the boy's body, and the boy is raised back to life, and he presents him back to his mother. The presence of God that went to war against that idol, went to war against poverty, and went to war against sickness, disease, and death. Those things don't change. That's why the Bible is an eternal book that never loses relevance in any generation. Because all these thousands of years later, there's still families that sickness is part of that family. People need treatment. There's, there's living care people that have to come and minister to people 24 hours a day. One person gets better. And they have to come back and treat the other person. The presence of God, the power of God put a stop to that plague of death. And I want to tell you today in Texas, that presence has not changed. Every family in the sound of my voice, that sickness has been a part of your home and you think it's normal. The power of God goes to war against that in your your home today in the name of Jesus Christ. And then poverty. There's a lot of people that have uh, things to say about if you preach that God will help you financially, 
but they're not intelligent people because you're never going to see God come to someone's home and leave them off worse than they came before. You know, a question I'd like to ask people that are opposed to prosperity, and they don't, they don't, well, that's that prosperity message. Has the gospel ever came to a nation and left it off worse economically? Never one time. When a nation gets a hold of this book, the people go up. That's why there's actually a war in the United States right now because if you're going to put everybody into servitude, having to have a universal basic income, you need to take this book away from people because this book destroys the mentality in you that I need someone to take care of me. This book tells you I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when I come in. Blessed when I go out again. My children are blessed. Psalm 112, my seed shall be mighty on the earth. If you believe that, can you let your amen be the loudest? And I know from my family, West Virginia coal miners, according to my grandmother on that side of the family, no one had any teeth. Couldn't afford to go to the dentist. Couldn't afford to get help. Go to the coal mine, work all day, get your little pay. They didn't even pay people in United States dollars. They paid you in company script that was redeemable at the coal mine company store and jack all the prices up. So they, you, you, were, you were put into a system where you could never get ahead. Everybody, they built a bunch, you know, 200 homes that were all the exact same size and specifications, and there you were. And my uncle, my grandfather wanders in to a tent meeting and gets born again and feels to give his life to the Lord. How are you going to make a living preaching and all that? And it, let me tell you, when God calls you, making a living will never be a prayer request the rest of your life. I am Jehovah Jireh. I take care of all the needs of my children. In fact, you read in the Bible, God said, when you obey me, see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Not, not slice you a slice of blessing. Pour you out a blessing that's so great that the only problem you'll ever have is how to take it all in. And I can testify to this day that from that day, my grandfather made that decision. If you were here Friday night when I received the offering, I took time on it. God has been very, very, very good to our family. He's a protector. He's a provider. He's a healer. He's a wonderful, wonderful God. And I hope you can see something. This isn't meant to be political because both sides, the Republicans and Democrats, are two heads on the same snake. There's no money to be made off of you being free and learning to trust God for yourself. There's a lot of money to be made off of you being made to feel, and that's what happens. When you stop preaching God to a generation, they begin to look for political leaders to do what only God can do. How many people on Facebook during the last year and a half said, Governor, what plans are you making to keep us safe from a virus? As if a politician has any power to stop a virus. It doesn't work like that. I want to point your heart today and fill you with a passionate love that everything you need is found in the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And I'm going to tell you, that's why CNN and, 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 and the New York media and the L.A. media hate you people. Because there's this one state of people that are too stubborn to let go of their dumb God that they think's real. And I want to tell you today, don't ever let go of that hand of God that pulled you out of the pit. The devil hates it, but that God will pull you and your family out of whatever pit you're in and set your feet on the rock to stay. Because I'm three generations deep now. My dad's a preacher. My grandfather was a preacher, the first Christian in our family. And I'm telling you, God never leads backward. God always leads forward. God never leads to less. God always leads to more. He's a God of increase. The entire kingdom of God 
is built on increase. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn on the ear. God, the first command he gave man, be fruitful and multiply, which is something you can't do on your own. God, when you allow his presence to come in, they drop that Ark of the Covenant. Off at a man's home, Obed-Edom of Gath, he didn't even, wasn't even in on the covenant. And that thing sitting in his home caused, the Bible said, and God began to bless Obed-Edom and everything he owned. And then you check back up on him in Chronicles. And he has all those mighty male descendants that the Bible says there wasn't one dullard, one idiot, one dummy among them. They were all very capable men. When the presence of God comes into your home, it affects everything that's under that roof. If you put your house in covenant with God, the Lord will get into everything. You know, it's like, like when we, we stay in hotels all the time. What do they always tell you to do? Don't smoke. If you smoke, there's going to be a fine. Not because they're against smoking, but they're, if you smoke in that room, it affects everything. Gets in the drapes, gets in the carpet, gets on the lamp. It ruins the room. Well, you know, those things can happen in the positive too. That when the presence of God is allowed in a home, it soaks into the children. It's different going into bed, in a bedroom of the people who serve the Lord. Can you say amen? And whatever happened when David, who was jealous of that blessing, when he found out that everything was blooming at Obed-Edom's home, the cows were having healthy cows. The sheep were having healthy sheep. Everything that he owned was blessed. It's part of the covenant. Your cows will be blessed. Your sheep will be blessed. Your fruit-bearing trees will be blessed. It literally affects. What did God say when he brought them out of Egypt? In all these years that I was with you, did your clothes, there was no laundromat between Egypt and Canaan. Did your clothes ever wear out? Did your feet ever blister? It literally affects everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> it's why they can go door to door. Now, if you got vaccinated, congratulations. But it's why, and I'm not telling you not to get vaccinated. I'm just telling you, that's why they can't get me interested in it. Because number one, I hate leaving the house. Number two, if you came to my house, how could you, you can't, I'm too drunk on what I'm preaching you. How could that thing that's of hell drive out the heaven that's in me? What I have in me doesn't bow to disease. What I have in me brings disease to its knees. I've already been vaccinated with the blood of Jesus, the presence of God, the fire of the Holy Ghost, and sickness still bows to all those things in 2021. And that's not about the vaccine. That's, a, that's about a principle. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. There's something birthed in the presence of God in the believer that can't, be, can't bow to disease. You're put on the earth. He gave them dominion. They placed the sick in Peter's path that perchance his shadow might fall across them and they'd be healed. The overflow of that blessing is enough to destroy the work of the devil in the people that you're around. I was reading Dr. Teal Osborne's manuscript last week about how he got a hold of uh, Isaiah 42, 12. The people of the island shall praise me. And when he read it, he felt to go to Jamaica. And they brought that deaf school to him, 68 students. And 62 heard and spoke after the first night's meeting. They, him and his wife Daisy prayed for him until 2.30 in the morning. And then they prayed for the rest of them the next night, and the others heard and spoke. And the third night, all the teachers came to get prayer for new jobs because the government closed the deaf school down. That's a true story. That's not from 1800. That's from 19, the 1950s and 60s. Then he went to Africa, did the, blitzed that country, put up a stage and started telling people, the presence of God is the highest thing. Smith Wigglesworth said, I would rather have the anointing, which is the manifest presence of God, for five minutes than the entire world given to me with a white picket fence around it. If you've never experienced that, 
If you've never had it, then it sounds like a foreign language that weirdos are talking about. But if you get a taste of the presence of God, the old songwriter said the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I'm preaching this today because God has a plan to visit you. Did you know in one day? It doesn't have to take 30 years. There can be one day, like today, where you make up your mind, enough is enough. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And God will visit you, and your life will never be the same. If you can testify to that, one more time, put those Texas hands together and give God a mighty shout of praise. He's a wonderful God. Great I am. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, El Shaddai. What's El Shaddai? God told Abraham, Abraham, see all these people around you, the Philistines. See all their banks. See all their food. See all their land. If you put me first, you'll never have to go to them for one thing. I am El Shaddai. I will supply all your needs. Are all your needs financial? No, they're not. They didn't just mean money, though he meant money. He meant everything. I'll provide you friends. You don't have to go to the world for friends. You won't have to go to the world for a wife. You won't have to go to the world for anything. I'll supply everything. I'm only 40 years old, but my plan is to just get extremely old-fashioned. I don't mean like 1940s. I mean like 40s. Like 40 A.D. <laughs> Where I have like, I'm a Christian. I'm a full-time Christian and a part-time everything else. That's how Christians used to be. I was actually reading a story in the front row of a man. His first name was Elliot. This is just like 100 years ago. And he wouldn't run his Olympic trial race. He was the be best at the 100 meters in the world. And he wouldn't run it because they had the race on a Sunday and he was a Christian. You don't hear about that kind of Christian in the West anymore. Not in Europe or Canada or America, that's for sure. Well, I have work, you know, we have to work. No, I'm a full-time Christian and a part-time everything else. That's what you see in the Bible. Uh, hello, my name's Daniel. I know you said we have to eat this stuff. I don't eat that. I eat other things. Because I can't take the chance you offered that meat to idols. So. Just so you know, I'm a Hebrew. I live for God. All right, we'll let you do it. And they found out that the Hebrew boys were stronger and fitter doing things God's way than all their people doing it their way. Too many Christians, and I'm not here to scold you. This is a happy day. Also, I'm not in a bad mood. But too many Christians, they're just like Americans who go to church. They do believe in God. They will make heaven. They've accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But there's a difference between making Jesus receiving what he did for you on the cross, and making Jesus Lord. You are first. You know, we used to sing songs when I was a little kid. They'd, they'd lead them like in children's church. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll do what you call me to do. One of the first songs they'd teach us was uh, uh, about following Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me. Still, I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. And the reason the stuff I'm preaching, there's like a disconnect most places I preach it. Because people in their mind, they think, well, I am a Christian. I've never seen God drive sickness out of my family. Or, you know, I'm basically middle class, lower middle class. And any blessing I have, I can basically point to like a physical reason why I have it. I worked hard. I secured a contract. There was no prayer involved. Because there's a difference between between Christians. You can receive what Christ did for you on the cross by faith and you'll go to heaven. But when you really take up your cross and follow Christ and put him first, I'm telling you, the God first lifestyle not only destroys the whole of the devil. God said that. See if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Everybody say the blessing. And then there's a the second part. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Anytime you start to get blessed, word gets out among tax collectors or demons or demons who work in tax collection to come go get their cut. 
God's not an idiot. He knows there's forces at work to limit how high you can fly. Then he said, if you put me first, you'll never even have to pray about it. I'll rebuke them for your sake. I will, not you will, I will. You'll find out about dead enemies after they've already been deadened. Can you say amen? amen? If you put me first, you don't have to pray about enemies. Praying about enemies is for unsaved people or half committed people. I will rebuke, though your enemy will attack you from one direction. I will make him run from you in seven directions. Can you say amen? amen. Just put God first. Keep putting him first. Well, how, how then? Let me read you one thing before I tell you about how you put God first. Practically. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue, 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messengers to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, yeah, there was a fiery furnace. Yeah, not they'll be fined. They'll be burned to death. We had to shut our church down last year. We had over eight negative Facebook comments left on our church's page when we said we were going to stay open. The Western Christian has no, no understanding of what it means to stand for God. And I don't like preaching against America, and I'm not preaching against America. I'm wearing red uh, or blue, white, and kind of red. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the blessings of a country. I went to go to your new ballpark yesterday and go see a game and enjoyed myself. I enjoy air conditioning. I enjoy Wi-Fi. I enjoy Uber cars, not having to hail a cab because I never learned how to whistle. But you can't allow the comforts and blessings of God to make you soft. When your time comes, I don't mean your time to die. I mean when your time comes where the enemy sees how serious you are about this thing and goes to put you to the test. You make up your mind on nice days like today when you're dressed nice. You know when they told us we couldn't have church last year and I stayed open anyway and it looked like I was going to get arrested. I don't know. I still don't know why I didn't. I tried did everything in my power to try to get arrested. <laughs> that was not a decision I made in March of 2020. That was a decision I made when I was like six. I heard my dad preach on Bible prophecy. I knew the day would come where if Jesus tarried, we would be forced into a one world religion and then take a mark injected into your right hand or in your forehead and anyone refusing to receive that mark would be beheaded. And I made up my mind, whenever that day comes, they ever come and say you can't have a Bible, they ever come and say you can't have church, if you're looking to kill Christians, you can grab me first. If you're going to start in California putting people in jail for singing praise because singing communicates the virus, you can build a jail cell for me first because I'm not looking for a type of Christianity that the United Nations and World Health Organization and World Economic Forum approve of. I've decided I'm going to live a book of Acts Christianity where I do it God's way with or without man's approval. And you'll have your time. Preacher or oil field worker, whatever you are, there will come a time where you have to choose between going the easy way or going God's way. I was going to say, how many, but you're, you're going to make the right decision. That's why I'm preaching. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word, and faith is an action. So I'm actually preaching the power to make the right decision in you because you can't try to be brave. The Bible doesn't say the righteous try to be bold. The Bible says the wicked run when no man pursueth. 
That's why you'll never catch me jogging. Every time I see somebody in bright running sneakers running down the road, I think, well, sinner needs Jesus. The wicked run when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. David was righteous. He heard his God being marked by Goliath. He immediately had no care for how tall Goliath was, how many battles he had won. No one, he actually wrote in the Psalms, when they insult you, it's like they're insulting me. He was not a soldier. He went and did it because he made up his mind, it's God first. I'd rather die for God than live for nothing. The goal of life is not survival. The goal of life is to uphold the righteous principles of the Bible and train your family to serve the Lord. You believe it? Can you say amen? amen. Verse 8, but some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn and all the other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you've put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you've set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, It's true. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I've set up? I will give you one more chance. And I want you to notice that. The devil has no plan for the man who refuses to comply. All he can do is keep offering you chances. I'm 20 years into evangelism now. I've lost track of the number of times I've had people come to the altar and say they had a text on their phone waiting when they got back from an old friend they hadn't heard of, old girlfriend, old boyfriend, come to my house, come to the club, because the devil in all the altar calls I've given in 20 years, not one time has somebody lifted their hand to get saved, come out into the aisle to come to the altar, and a green goblin appears. The devil doesn't have power to make you do what he wants you to do. He can only. So what did Nebuchadnezzar do? Heat a furnace, threaten. They're saying that if you keep your church open, you know, they're going to, they're going to what? The devil is a manipulator. If you do that, I'll do this. But if you ever call his bluff, like David did, I'll feed you to the birds of the air. Oh, you will. Enough talking. Let's fight. You find out in the story of Goliath, the devil is a big talker and a terrible fighter. I've cast devils out. You weren't in those meetings, but you can read the ones Jesus did. De demons shriek. They don't have strong voices. They're weak. Jesus defeated them 2,000 years ago on the cross. And if I can, by the grace of God, get you today to see that there's bigger principles at play. When your boss offers you a promotion, provided you'll work Sunday morning, it's not. It's, it's a... Supernatural thing being carried out to try to buy your soul for an extra 21000 a year in an office with a window. And the more things you walk away from, the stronger the test is. That's why Joseph is a type of Christ. Because he was tempted in all the ways the enemy tempts. And he would not do it. When, when Potiphar's wife threw herself at Joseph and said, please sleep with me. He didn't say, I can't do that, you're married. He said, how could I do such a wicked thing against God? He didn't see decisions as being on this level. He saw them as, I'm a righteous man on my way to heaven, and this is something to take me off of that path. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's more to life than living and dying. There really is a heaven. There really is a hell. And every person is going to spend their eternity in one of those two places and nobody goes to heaven by themselves and nobody goes to hell by themselves. Wherever you decide to go, you're blazing a trail for your family to follow with you. 85% of sons follow the spiritual example set by their father. So when you make up your mind, well, Sunday's the only day I have on, just got to mow the yard. I mean, you drive to church, there's people spraying the sidewalk. Be nice to be in hell with the cleanest sidewalk in all of Dallas. 
When I see people doing things, I say, like, what are you doing with their kids? No one taking the kids to church. Why? What is, you had the whole week, and then God said, give me the first hours of a new week to honor me. God's not difficult to figure out. He wants honor. He wants what's first. Give me, my son, give me your heart. And if you give him honor in your heart, for whom I'm not preaching to the people that are spraying their sidewalks. I'm preaching to the people that got up and got dressed to take the first hours. So look, whatever little guilty thing you have playing in your head right now that the devil gets, you're, you're actually not a good person. You're not that bad. I don't see any dried blood on anybody from people you murdered. And however wrong you live before now, you're not doing that now, are you? And then people come up to me on Sunday morning, you know, I'm a, I'm a drinker. I said, where's your alcohol? Well, it's not on me. Yeah, you're not drinking now. Quit letting the devil have you identify but what you did before today. Make up your mind. I'm done with alcohol. I'm done with depression. I'm done with sickness. I'm done with the devil. As for me and my house, we will not bow to the bales. We will serve the Lord. Shout out loud, God first. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the afternoon, Jesus at night. Get a reputation. Oh, you go to that guy's house, you're going to have to hear about Jesus. You go eat lunch with Larry, you're going to have to hear about Jesus. And wear it proudly. Learn to enjoy the reproach of the world. I'm not talking about reproach for being a moron. Learn to enjoy their insults. Man, don't work extra hard because you took our Sunday morning to go to your church. Just keep plugging. The devil, I'm going to tell you, you'll be a very confusing person, not just for the devil, but people in general, because they don't know what to do with people that can't be manipulated. When they throw some big consequence at you, you don't even blink, no, no problem then. You hold, like in Canada, you hold church this Sunday, we're going to seize all your property. Enjoy the property. God gave me everything I had anyway. If you'd like to hold on to it, the owner will meet with you. <laughs> Can't take anything from me anyway. I don't own a thing. I'm a steward of my master's possessions. Whatever you take from me, you're stealing from him. Say one more chance. Say devil. You can take your one more chance. I was going to say and shove it, but we're in church, so you don't talk like that. Give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I've made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He'll rescue us from your power. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you that we will never bow to serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you've set up. Now, that was an unbelief. The first statement, our God is able to deliver us, is called faith. The second statement is actually a level higher than faith. It's called trust. They weren't saying, well, even if he does it sometimes. No. I'd rather burn. Our God will deliver us. But if he doesn't, just so you know, I'd rather burn in your furnace than bow to your statue. And any time you call the devil's bluff, you enter into a different realm. We'll take your house. What are you going to do in the future when they start making it that if you don't believe in evolution, you believe your God's the only way to heaven? They're, all, they're already writing the wording that if you think Jesus is the only way, to, your God's the only way to heaven, you're a domestic terrorist. What are you going to do if you start doing that and Chase Manhattan Bank won't do anything with you? Bank of America won't process your credit cards. See, I've traveled. I preached near Angola where the pastor came and told me they can't take offerings. No bank will do any business with the church. And they've done away with cash. So you just can't get it. What am I going to do? You, I said, you know what to do? Call a week of revival meetings and push it harder. 
Do what Benson Hosa did in Nigeria when they passed a law. No Christian services after 6 p.m. And no one, no public conversions. It's illegal to convert someone that's outside of your family. And the next day, put up billboards. We're having a million soul crusade with T.L. Osborne in the stadium. And the other pastors said, did God speak? You know, this, this is a military dictatorship. You just disappear. You don't lose your Facebook account. He took me on Facebook. Who cares? One day Facebook will be MySpace. And it's looking like it'll be about August or September. They said, did God speak to you about holding those services in that stadium? He said, no, God didn't have to. Anything the devil tells you not to do, do the opposite twice. And that man was born into a nation called Nigeria that had about 400 Protestant churches when he was born. And by the age of 58, he started 9,600 churches by defying the devil. Now, I'm going to tell you, because I don't have time to read it, but that last paragraph, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go into the furnace. And the king says, I see four men, loose and unbound, walking in that fire. And the fourth looks like the Son of God. And he tells them to come out, and he says, Blessed be the God, the same one that went to kill him for it. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. For they defied the king's command. Who was the king? Him. That's kind of a weird thing to say. Never had my mom say that. Blessed be Jonathan, who defied his mother's command. Because they, you want to know something? They teach you in America how to build bridges to reach people. But do you know what actually gets people in power's attention? Someone that's willing to sacrifice everything for their God. They can write you off as somebody that blows smoke. When you do what you're told and are willing to lay your Bible down and not sing, you know, I mean, no, we don't have to, churches aren't buildings, churches are um, us. Then they start telling in other countries, they, in Australia, last week, Australia, they made it illegal to sing. In England, they made it illegal to sing. Do you think people say, well, no, that's where we're going to take our stand? You might have told us that we can't go to church, but we're not going to, no. I heard one English pastor get on his Instagram and say, actually, there's nine Hebrew words in the Bible for praise, and only four involve singing. I mean, no, we can, we can praise. See, if you're a coward, if you're a compromiser, you can always find a way. Question. Were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the only Christians, or the only, the only Hebrews in Babylon? Far from it. So why were they the only three that didn't bow? What were the other ones doing? Hey, God knows our heart. Hey, Shadrach, yeah, come on. You have family. God knows your heart. God, uh, God's not, how many know God's not interested about our physical posture per se? He's interested in the posture of our heart. <laughs> Did you know Daniel in the same book wasn't ordered to never pray again? He was ordered to suspend praying for 30 days. And he wouldn't do it. There are principles that you should set today that I will never, ever break these principles. I build the man who listens to my teaching and builds his life on it. It's like a wise man who builds his life on the rock. The winds of life come. The waves of life crash, but they have no power to destroy the house because it's built on the word of God. There was a story I remembered hearing when I was a little kid, and he promoted them. The only people that died from the fire were the people who bowed. The men who were ordered to put them in the furnace had bowed to the statue. The fire came out and killed them. The world is a liar. Everything they say, it's the opposite. They tell you that if you bow, you'll burn. These churches that stayed open during the pandemic, what are they going to say when all their members are dead? All the churches that are open, in fact, that guy in Calgary. You know, I like reading stories about people that have guts. Pastor James up in Calgary, 
the government took his property. The government built two fences. This is in Canada, not Pakistan. Built two fences around his church and seized the property. Put him in jail for 35 days. He's got a wife and three kids, and they weren't allowed to see him. They let murderers out and put him in, just like with Barabbas and Jesus. I heard, I heard pastors say, can you believe they would release a murderer and then arrest a Christian? Yeah, it's actually how the whole thing started. It's the same devil. Nothing has changed. And they let him out of prison a couple weeks ago, and they gave the church their property back. And I saw a video on the news of their church meeting. This is in Canada, where if you have a church of 40 people, you're doing pretty good. They showed the crowd, and I thought, well, that's a decent crowd. But it's not, like, great. But it was because it was the lobby. And then as the camera went into the sanctuary, that place was jammed. Had to be minimum 2,000 people in a place that looks like it seats about 1,600. <laughs> Newly saved people. Because somebody found out, that, oh, there's actually real Christians that believe in their God. Like the, Jew, like the Jewish people do. Look at what they did when Cuomo was shutting synagogues. They're on the street praying. They've been through it before in Russia. They've been through it in Germany. And God is looking for in this last generation of time for fathers and mothers and teenagers and university students that don't duck their head, that stand when they're told to bow and say, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'll never bow to any bail. If that sounds like you, shout a living amen. amen. I'm going to close, but before I do, that's why there's a disconnect with people. They hear people preach about healing and blessing and planes and property acquisition. It must be nice. I know. I got a nice deal. I got money to me. Because there's a difference in men. Do you think all men are the same? You haven't met more than two. There's a difference in Christians. There's a difference in commitment levels. Yeah, I'm going to say, you know, we have a softball tournament this weekend, but it's looking like it's going to rain. So if it ends up getting canceled, we'll be there on Sunday. Go worship softball. The next time you're sick, pray to your Easton bat. Because that person, if you ask him, thinks God's number one. But you can tell. You can tell. Faith has corresponding action. You love Burger King. You don't have to listen to a seven-part seminar on Burger King. You just spend money there. You love to go. And when you love God, people don't even really have to tell you much about the benefits. Though it's great to know. Basically, it'll just explain to you why everything's been working so good. You make up your mind like David said. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. What do you do to enter into that Obed-Edom kind of blessing? Because I know there's people here. Not everybody was here Friday night. So I'm going to have you say what I had them say. Say this out loud. I may have come from a broken home. But a broken home will not come from me. One person can make up their mind. I'm going to stop rehearsing what's gone wrong before now, and I'm going, to, I'm going to put God first in our family. And everything will change. You're not asked to bow to a statue right now. Though according to Revelation uh, chapter 14, it'll actually get to that point. But for now, what does it mean to not bow to Baal? Well, if I could talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, all of you would have your individual story of what it means to not bow to Bill. Or when you knew you were confronted with that and decided not to. The one that comes to mind for me the most was when I was doing an outdoor crusade in Philadelphia. This lady got really saved and really touched by God. She came to every meeting. And then at the end, she came up to me and said, Pastor Jonathan, I don't know what I'm going to do. She said, I, 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 this was the best week I've ever had. I, I gave my life to the Lord. She had three kids, single mother. But the man that I'm living with, and that's all she said. And I finished the rest because it wasn't my first rodeo. I know the devil. The Bible says we're not unaware of his tricks. But the man I'm living with, and I just picked up where she left off, said that if you won't sleep with him, you can't live with him. You don't have a home for you and your kids. You don't know what to do. How would you know? Because I know the devil. 
master threatener. He said, what should I do? I said, I don't have to tell you. One thing you find out when you counsel people, they actually don't need any help. They know the right thing to do. You know the Bible says that. I've shown you, oh man, what is good. I don't believe people when they say I don't know what to do. What they do is they know what to do, but they know the consequences, and they're looking for someone that will agree that compromising is okay. I said, I think you know what to do. You tell me. She told me, and I was glad because I didn't want to tell a single mother with three kids what to do. She said, I can't live there and go to heaven. And I told her God will provide for us. And I didn't say it callously. Oh, God will provide. Just trust the Lord. I don't mean that. I mean talking to a 30-year-old woman with three kids that's got nowhere to go if that guy kicks her out. And I prayed. Father, as she stands for you, I thank you for the story we find in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they not only were delivered from the fire, they received promotions to even higher positions. What the devil, and she, she wrote me back later, everything wasn't all right, everything was awesome. I think everything worked out in like 36 hours. She never spent a night out on a bus stop or anything. But if God won't do that. But she's a liar. That's what people, you know, even Christians, that's what Christians think. Well, how could you let a woman go out on the street? I can't believe God for you. I can't love God for you. I can only point you in that direction and let you know there's a book full of stories up there that if you put God first, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And he may let your behind touch the fire for a little bit, but he'll stand with you in the fire. Now, when you see that, Shadrach, Shad- Meshach, and Abednego said, no, I know God's going to deliver us. I know he's going to deliver us. And then when they got close, okay, I guess he's, no. We'll do, when you commit, it's like my wife and I. When we made that decision, I talked to her on the phone from India when I had, the first time in my life, saw kids starving to death. And I said, we're going to feed, which was the most, it wasn't the most I could afford. It was way more than I could afford. We're going to feed 40 kids a month, which was more than our rent for our 800 square foot apartment. And she never questioned me. And I told her, I said, now, if we're not able to pay our rent, then we'll go live in a state park or whatever. And I was dead serious. But I would rather do that and and, and know I I didn't watch that. Well, isn't that a shame? I'm doing what I can do and go sleep under the stars. Then I would just lay in my bed and go, it's a shame. Hope someone can help them. And we committed to that. (laughs) I committed to homelessness. And the next meeting, church of 120 people. I took two offerings that week, $92,000. The most that church had given to an evangelist in 40 years was $2,300, $92,000. And I stumbled onto a little secret that when you put God first and commit, I don't care if I have to be, you can take everything from me, I'm going to go after God and his kingdom. You don't lack and live in homelessness. The blessing that engulfed Obed-Edom's house begins to engulf everything that pertains to you. And I want to challenge you right now. Whatever bail you're facing, whatever Nebuchadnezzar that's manipulating you that if you don't bow and make a compromise, like that woman, you won't sleep with me. That's how the devil works. Do what you know to be wrong to do, and I I won't force any consequences on you. But you find out when you're God's child, the devil actually doesn't have any ability to force any consequences on you. The devil's not in charge of your destiny. God has determined your destiny, and he knows the plan he has for you. A plan to prosper you and never to harm you. That's what I told that lady in Philadelphia. I said, let me ask you a question. Do you think God sent me to Philadelphia to ruin your life? You're having a nice life with a guy that you can't stand, that grosses you out, but your kids need a place to sleep. But then this skinny preacher came back then. And then I'm, now I'm homeless. I said, or do you think the Lord sent me here to put a fire in you that the thing you knew was wrong anyway? To, that's what an evangelist does. It's like, like you light something and people, yeah, I already knew that. It already didn't sit right on the inside of me. He's, the word's right. 
God's right, and I'm doing it now. And I'm telling you, it might not be living with a man. It might be some other compromise, bowing to Baal. You know what it is. But today, God is calling you to stand up, knock those shackles off, and say from this day forward, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Stand on your feet, everybody. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If Shadrach, Meshach, or if Joshua was an American, he would have said, as for me and my house, we're going to try to start serving the Lord. Well, that's not it. It's, everybody say commit. Starts with commitment. Just like in marriage. When I had to repeat those vows to my wife, I'll, pr- I'll protect you and provide for you. It's like, I can't even protect myself. I can't even provide for me. Standing there at 25, I'm going to provide for you all the days of your life. Thinking, how are you? It starts with vows. And those vows carry power. When God hears the words coming out of your heart, I'm going to serve you. He doesn't say, well, best of luck. Did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They thought they were going into the fire by themselves, but who stood with them? Jesus is looking to stand with you in the fire. I promise you, and you can remember this, and if you think I'm blowing smoke, just hang around. If it ever gets to a point where they go to shoot people for being a Christian, when they threaten me to denounce Christ with gunpoint, I will take the gun and go like this. I've eaten at Papa Do, Papa Cito's, all the Papa's, right. what else is there to do? I've had steak, I've had Mexican food, I've had Italian food, I've lived, I've, I've, I've been, I've seen beaches. Mountains, snow, heat. I got it. The only reason I'm here. What did Paul say? It's actually better for me if I go to heaven, but it's far better for you if I stay. I'm here on a mission for God to preach the gospel and win the lost. And when that's over, I'm going to go up to heaven and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. You live in a wicked world, but you would not bow to their gods. Now come receive my reward. Hallelujah. I love, I love that when Stephen was stoned to death, Jesus wasn't in heaven going, you really should choose your words better. You can win more flies with honey. The Bible says Jesus, Stephen said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Let me ask you a question. The Bible says when Christ ascended into heaven, he went to the right hand of his father and did what? So why did Stephen see him standing? Because normally there's some angel that welcomes you into heaven. But Jesus said, I'm going to get this one myself. That was a good sermon. I liked when you called them stiff-necked and uncircumcised. That's a new one. I used whitewashed walls, but I like your one better. I'll show you to my mansion myself. That's my, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to heaven. I'm not ducking my head when I see Paul. I'm not ducking my head when I see Wigglesworth and all those other guys. I'm going to get high fives from them. And most of all, I'm going to get a commendation from Christ. I'm going to get a crown. And I'm going to go to a big gold mansion and go to sleep for about 90 or 100 years. I'll get my marriage supper of the meal, meal to go. Styrofoam container. Can you say Amen. Jesus, knowing the joy that was set before him, endured the indignity and shame of the cross. That's why I started with what's in the blessing. Because that's what makes you not care. That's what I mean. I'm willing to suffer everything I can get out. No, you're not supposed to look like you got baptized in pickle juice. <laughs> knowing the joy. Everybody say the joy. joy. I'll go up to heaven and receive my reward. And heaven is the home not of compromisers. Heaven is the home to they that overcome. I will cause them to sit on my throne. Heaven is the home. Say it with me. Say heaven, heaven is, the is the home of overcomers. Of overcomers. Say from today, from today, I'm an overcomer. I'm, an overcomer. I'm, not a I'm not a compromiser. Every head bowed, every eye closed.
There are people here right now, you are in a state of compromise. And you know it's time to break out of it now. You've never given God your whole heart. Teenagers, university students, somebody lied to you and just made it, well, you know, when we're young, we ought, no. Youth is an important time. Youth's a time to get running with your calling, not go out in the world and whatever they tell you you're supposed to do. A lot of people do that and don't ever come back. You experiment with the devil in these days, you die. I'm calling you right now to make up your mind like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I refuse to bow. I'm going to stand for God from this day forward. And as for me and my house, I'm not going to blaze a trail of compromise for my sons to follow. I'm going to do what Obed-Edom did and end up where all my descendants are capable men who serve in the house of the Lord. If you're here, this isn't everybody, but there are people. The truth is right now, you're a Hebrew in Babylon. You haven't gone full Babylon, but you're bowing. You're not a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You've compromised. You go to church when there's time, read the Bible here and there. But basically, you're an American who goes to church sometimes. You've never crossed that line that I'm going all in for God. And you know the Lord's dealing with your heart to do that right now. I'm not going to hold you long, but we're going to pray. You say, Jonathan, I make up my mind today. No more compromise, no more sin. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want you to quickly put your hand up high and wave it at me, and we're going to pray right now. Do it bold and do it strong. I see it. Lots of young people. That's great. Who else? Keep your hands up. Amen. So awesome. Very quickly, just to let the devil know an extra, see, see you later, sucker. See you never. I want you to step out of your seat and stand at the altar. We're going to pray. I'll have you go right back to your seat. And you're going to leave here with a victory. Come right now. Every chain of compromise broken. Power to serve God. Power to serve God. Power to serve God. Nobody puts God first and finishes last. Nobody. Now, listen, you respect your employer. But the truth is, nobody has the ability to demote you, and nobody has the ability to promote you. God, your life, when you put it in God's hands, he's the one that promotes. Man, he do that, you're going to, you know, I'll never promote you. The Lord, oh, really? Just like that, what God will be able to save you from the furnace thing? God said, oh, yeah. God's real. This is not a philosophy. This is not like nice things we live by. God is living and active in the life of the believer. And he's going to take good care of you. We heard that you prayed with one of your patients. If we hear that again, we'll have to fire you. Let's see. Let's see, if, let's see whether God's a liar or not. Whether man can demote you or not. You know, I know God. I can tell you I've already preached too long. I can tell you stories of situations where that happened. The person they were going to fire got promoted over top of the person who was going to fire them and had to make them tea every morning. God has a sense of humor. God will do for you what no man could ever do for you if you put him first. It's the devil that gives you a little life in some man's bed you don't like so you have a roof over you. That ain't God. God will, God will make you head of the housing development. That's God. Put your hands up high. Say this out loud. Heavenly Father, say it nice and loud. Heavenly Father, I give you my life today. I commit to your word. I'll do what you've told me to do. I'll be who you've told me to be. I'll say what you've told me to say. I need your power so I can live like you. I receive your power right now at this altar. Fill me with your spirit in Jesus' name. And as that power from God's spirit fills you, Everything that you know is a compromise. Everything the Holy Spirit spoke to you about in your spirit, big or small, that you know enough's enough. 
This is the day I have to walk away from that forever. Receive power from heaven to live for God all the days of your life. And I'm going to impart a gift to you right now. Father, the same thing you gave me from boyhood by the Holy Ghost. A severe don't care about what the world thinks. And a passion about you and your opinions. I loose that into their spirit. I loosen your spirit now. Where people's words that used to manipulate you won't have any power over you anymore. It'll be like listening to a four-year-old tell you that Superman lives in his closet. You say, oh, really? In Jesus' name. Their words won't have any power. And God's word will matter to you. In Jesus' name. Any consequence from prior compromise that's tried to cling to your life in the realm of sickness, in the realm of finance, anything, I break its hold on you right now. The Lord will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. The heathen will see it and know that you're a person claimed by God, and they'll stand in awe of you. Just stay there with your hands lifted and let God touch you. And then, since I like you so much, because I will spend a month here. I want you to lift both hands, every person in, in your seats. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Whatever issue of concern you came in here with, it does not leave with you. The Lord lifts every heavy burden and destroys every yoke of bondage now because of the anointing. In Jesus' name, today marks a turning point for you and everyone who's connected to you. In Jesus' name. Say it out loud, I'm free. Free at last, free forever. In Jesus' name. Say, Christ is in my heart. The devil's under my feet. In Jesus' name. Tonight at uh, 6.30? 6. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to close out the, this wonderful week of meetings. And I want you to do everything in your power to be here. My wife's going to preach. It's been an awesome week. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again one more time. To everybody at this altar, don't let the enemy put one question mark. Well, what are you going to do now? You don't have to worry about it. You do what's right, and Jesus will stand with you. Remember, when he rose from the dead, he never died again. He's alive. He holds all power in his hand. And when you stick with him, good luck anybody putting you down. Best of luck to them. It'll never happen. Amen? I'm proud of you. When my grandfather stood at the altar in West Virginia at 18 or 19, he didn't look like much. But boy, the family's all different now. It just takes one person in the family to say, no, sir, no. I'm not living like that. And you're going to be the one. Amen? Give your brothers and sisters a big hand clap as they return to their seats. You can return to your seat. God bless you. Give Jesus a great big hand clap on the 25th anniversary of this great church, Pastor Mike and Vicki Hankins. Let me pray for you before you go to lunch. Both hands lifted. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful day.